The Sand Algarve is just under 60 kilometers long, a coastal strip from the city of Faro to the Spanish border. Its centerpiece, the Ria Formosa National Park, one of the largest protected lagoons in Europe. The Ria is 180,000 square kilometers of protected wetland. Between it and the open Atlantic lie five islands, and right in the middle, a mud flat. Kilometers of sandy beaches protect a mosaic of sandbanks and freshwater lagoons. And salt marshes, covered at high tide and crisscrossed by a labyrinth of channels at low tide. The nature park extends up to five kilometers into the hinterland, a garden of biodiversity. Due to the mild temperatures, it is visible and noticeable all year round. Hummingbird hawk moth, swallowtails and lizards are found in the evergreen vegetation. Seabirds and wading birds settle on the coastal strip. Permanent residents, swallows and seagulls. Faro is the administrative center of the Algarve, a place where Phoenicians, Greeks and Romans have settled. With its international airport, Faro is also the entry point for over four million tourists every year. Within sight of the runway, the western tip of the Ria Formosa begins with the Faro Island, a peninsula where the rules of the protected area have not yet been fully implemented. Most of these houses were built illegally, much like the case of José Santos. The 72-year-old was stranded here 20 years ago. A friend left the hut to the former labourer. This is the only way he can make ends meet on his meagre pension. Life is good here. Yes, it is good. but it is also a life on the edge. Yes, the house issue. They want to tear down all the houses, from the street down to here. I don't know when, though. Those affected are to be relocated to new accommodation, somewhere on the coast. That doesn't really make sense. There have always been houses here. Now they're tearing them down. Most islanders are skeptical. They believe that the measure is only intended to create space for large holiday resorts. Push. <laughs> Resist? Against whom? If I have to get out, I have to get out.
There is a project that aims to restore balance between the people and nature in the lagoon. It calls for the restoration of landscape values and is financed by the Portuguese state and the EU. Fishermen and shellfish collectors benefit from the project. After all, it safeguards marine wildlife for them and the seabirds. One of them is Vitor Lorenzo, who chucks through the lagoon on his boat early in the morning with his dog, Flecha, just before the tide goes down. A journey without a compass, with signposts that only locals know. All the streams have names. We are here in the stream of fish. Another one is called empty barrels, because boats loaded with barrels used to dock there. Each vein of water was given its own name. Vitor has been working in the mud flats since he was a boy. His parents were poor. He was only able to buy his school books with the money from his catch of mussels. Now the 66-year-old is retired, just like his buddies Chico and Helio. But the mudflats remain their elixir of life. Vitor collects razor clams according to an old tradition. Using salt as the mollusks sense danger and emerge from the sand. Sixty years ago, one would also collect some heavy metals in the process, back when oil tankers were allowed to enter the lagoon and pollute the sandy soils. Now everything is clean. For many years, the water was murky, rubbish was lying around. That is over. A jewel in the crown of Portugal. This is the Ria Formosa. The Ria has almost 300 mollusk species. They dwell amongst the algae in the rock pools, below the evergreen marsh meadows. The men who collect and sell these shells in all their variety are called mariscadores. They work in and with the tides. The tides in the Ria shift by one hour every day. Let's check the mussels and the oysters. First the mussels. Responsible shellfish collectors are as concerned about preserving the stock as they are about making a good catch. This oyster is very big. I'm leaving it here so it can reproduce, so that small oysters emerge. So that new ones grow. They really are from the rear. They're native. One should not collect too much, but if we collect little, we starve. Keeping the balance, that's important. At the edge of the mudflat is a University of Faro research center. The Institute works together with the EU Marine Biological Laboratories, a protected area, specializing in the study of seahorses. Miguel Correa and George Palma breed the distinctive bony fish here. Seahorses are rather sedentary creatures. The tail fin serves as a grasping arm, and with their little flickering fins, they can only move slowly, making them vulnerable. One aim of the research project is to explore harmful, but also beneficial environmental factors in order to secure and increase the population in the lagoon. Around 2,000 specimens grow in the laboratory every year. 
the big ones are released into the lagoon. It could be 40 or 30, a good number. The population of seahorses in the Ria Formosa was among the largest and most stable in the world. Then, 20 years ago, the number steadily decreased. Yes, look outside for them. I'm going out. The Portuguese parliament wants to establish two protected zones in the Ria, which may only be entered by researchers. This would not only ensure the survival of the seahorses, but that of all the mudflat animals. Seahorses are part of the marine food chain, a very important part. They are indicators of the state of their environment and surroundings of the state of the ecosystem. There was a very sharp drop, about 95% compared to the 2001 data. We suspect that habitat loss and climate change are reasons for this. Recently, we have also become concerned about fishermen who specialize in catching seahorses. Buyers are typically manufacturers of dubious remedies for the Asian market. For this purpose, they hunt millions of seahorses every year and sell them in the form of powder or a pill. Knowing full well that the species is subject to the Washington Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species, In front of the institute, directly in the mudflats, Carolina Murato is conducting research on the seahorses and their natural living conditions. The 29-year-old came to Faro from Lisbon to study, and she decided to stay. The ria is like a cradle for many species. There are many species of fish that spawn here, commercially attractive ones and insignificant ones. The whole area is very rich in marine life. This includes mudflats, seabirds and much more. More than half of all fish species in the Atlantic are said to lay eggs in the Ria. That is the researcher's estimate. Many species find shelter in the salty mud grass meadows. The dense stalks convert carbon monoxide into oxygen. As a marine biologist, Carolina knows the areas where the seahorses settle. Any newcomer would be helplessly lost in the murky waters of the seagrass beds. The seahorses are a trademark of the Ria Formosa. Their preservation is part of a plan for the restoration of the lagoon and its beautiful landscape. Faro Park Rangers ensure nature conservation rules are complied with in the mudflats of the nature park. 
José Lopes is the commander of the troop. With him on board, trainee Rafaela and deputy commander Carlos. Come on, step on it. Behind the bridge, see if you can see someone flushing their engine. Their target, polluters, ignorant tourists, illegal fishermen and shellfish collectors. Good morning. What are you doing? We are park rangers. Have you lost something? No. Have you lost something? I haven't. That was an octopus fisherman with a big hook. He is allowed to have that. A fish hook, on the other hand, would be illegal. It's an instrument with lots of teeth and barbs. Ahead, a fishing boat anchored in shallow water. Possible or not, I have not been able to see exactly. Oh, there's one in the water. That's suspicious. With a license, you are allowed to collect two kilos of mussels out of the mudflats every day. With a prohibited mussel trap, however, you can get up to 300 kilos. This brings a good daily income and tempts many to collect illegally at low tide. I was here just with the slip nets. I guess I'm a criminal now? I didn't say that, but I don't like being lied to. No, we didn't. Here's the slip net. Here it is. The sanding net is there. Ah, there is also a mussel trap. <laughs> we have already found it. Someone must have lost it in the water. It's clear what has happened. Equipment and shells are confiscated. They have to pay. But they will probably build a new fish trap. And then they'll be back in the rear tomorrow. They'll quickly earn back the 200 euro fine. In one day they earn that amount, or much more. The illegal booty is released back into the sea. The park rangers are not only hunters, but also animal rescuers. Let's try to catch the seagull. Then we'll take it to the bird sanctuary. It won't be able to fly soon. It probably has a fish hook or a piece of net in its mouth. We'll be back here in the next few days. Then we'll see if the seagull is still there. At some point, it'll be exhausted. We return to the coast of the Ria, to Faro. Vitor Lorenzo is not only a shellfish collector, but also a restaurateur. And the pub is also his living room. Ornamental fish lead a quiet life here. All the others end up on the grill or in the pan. For example, in the famous cataplana, a stew with vegetables, herbs and seafood. Vitor collected the mussels for his stew in the morning. Okay. 
the restaurant fell into Vitor's lap. As a teenager, he grilled fish in front of his parents' house. Farmers came and put their vegetables on the grill. The idea of opening a restaurant came about during a lively meal. It became a family business, which Vitor now runs together with his daughter, Sandra. Portuguese people are family-centered. Children usually only move out of their parents' home once they get married. Until then, they laugh, live, and cook together. At least once a day, the family meets for dinner. 66-year-old Vitor watches over it. My philosophy of life? To work, not to harm my neighbor, and to contribute to everything, so that we live in a community where everyone is well. We have to keep a balance. We have to find a way of living in order to live healthily and let the Ria be as it is, a beautiful lagoon. For that, everyone has to do their part. On the eastern edge of the Ria Formosa lies Tavira, only 30 kilometers from Faro. The former fishing town lies on the Rio Gilao, one of the freshwater tributaries of the nearby lagoon. From the 8th to the 13th century, Moors ruled large parts of the Iberian Peninsula. The Church of the Holy Mary stands on the foundation of one of its mosques. Tavira was a center of tuna fishing for centuries. Today, tourism is their most important source of income. In 1972, fishermen dismantled their gill nets that were set up in the mouth of the river after one animal got entangled in it. However, the old salt works are still in operation. Sea salt extracted by hand is more sought after than ever. Flamingos use the salt flats as resting and breeding places. In front of the salt marshes is the island of Tavira. The beach is over 10 kilometers long. A hot spot for beach walkers, shell collectors and nature lovers, but also for sun seekers and swimmers. At the Praia do Baril lies the so-called Anchor Cemetery, relics of a settlement of 80 families who used anchors to fasten their tuna nets to the seabed. In the early 60s, they moved to the coast. The fish yield was no longer enough to survive on. A narrow gauge railway now for tourists, it was built in 1884 by the Bochum Association for Mining and Cast Steel to transport fish, weighing up to a total of 700 kilograms, to the coast. Large schools of fish swim near the islands of the Ria Formosa.
further out, groups of bluefin tuna are still swimming free. They have been placed on the list of endangered species by the World Conservation Organization. At sunrise, boats arrive at the gates of Tavira, in the village of Santa Lucia. Commercial fishing in the nature park is allowed here, for example, for octopus. Octopus belong to the group of eight-armed squid. They're trapped in cages. You put bait in it. A mackerel or a sardine. You put it in here. The octopus swim around it and then go in. And that's it. Only octopus weighing over 750 grams may be sold and many of them end up in the Santa Lucia auction hall. Under strict hygiene measures, the cephalopods are sorted according to quality and weight. The daily auction begins at noon. Thanks to the abundant fishing grounds in the Ria, auction prices influence the octopus market throughout Portugal and Spain. The village has therefore been nicknamed the octopus capital. That's life. You have to kill. You have to kill to eat. But we die first. That still leaves a lot of octopus to catch. Almost in the centre of the Ria Formosa lies the small town of Oliao. The Harbour Market Hall is its landmark, and you can't miss it from afar. This historic centre is a protected area a maze of alleys that open up into squares. The market square with its pubs, cafes and shops is the meeting place for inhabitants. In one of the two halls, only marine animals are sold. Fresh from the Ria Formosa. The vendors are mostly fishermen and shellfish collectors who offer their own catch. This is bream mackerel. Also very good, big eye bream. Attention is paid to hygiene in the sale of these perishable goods. I prefer meat. When I was young, I went on one of those big fishing boats to Morocco. I was 13 years old, and they made me eat fish on board all the time. Now I eat meat every day. Oliao lies within the bounds of the protection of the offshore lagoon island of Culatra. The village of the same name has neither cars nor roads. Visitors arrive by ferry or water taxi for a day trip. There are no hotels, only a few holiday flats. In the evenings, the approximately 700 inhabitants are happy to be amongst themselves.
almost everyone here lives off the sea. Only the former mussel collector Neusa Martins has retrained to become a pastry cook. Neusa's speciality, so-called jesuitas, puff pastry pockets filled with jam. That's better. When you collect mussels, you get a lot of sun. You work and it gets very hot. We work and we're always bent over. You get back pain. I've been working in the pastry shop for 22, 23 years. You work more in the summer. In winter it's quieter, more for the people from the island. And in summer there are more tourists, visitors. People have known me here for a long time. People also order here, and that goes to the restaurants. Almond tart, chocolate tart, orange tart, meringue tart, Molotov pudding. Kulatra Island is also called Lighthouse Island. After a lighthouse found on the southern tip of the island, it takes 45 minutes to get there by foot. The lighthouse was built in the middle of the 19th century. Four guards work here around the clock in two-man shifts. Ataid Correa and Helda Mendonza are on duty today. They have to climb 220 steps, then they are 50 meters above sea level. Lens technology was developed at the beginning of the 20th century by the French physicist Augustin Jean Fresnel. The light shines up to 40 kilometers away. The lighthouse is still important today. No one has to fear for their job here. When my father retired, there was talk that the profession of lighthouse keeper would die out. Since then, 30 years have passed and there are still new people starting with us. We are needed. Modern technologies like radar and GPS are now the standard at sea, but their security is deceptive. I have a boat now. There I look at a small screen. I know where I am. I rarely look out to sea. But when the boat battery dies, what do I use to orient myself when I'm far out at sea? By this little light. I know. There is land, there is safety. It's the last refuge for all sailors. The warden's other task, to check the beacons in the channels of the rear. Barely 500 meters separate the lighthouse from the island of Deserta, Isabel Fagundes' territory, a nature and bird conservationist. Deserta is considered the most untouched of the five lagoon islands. Isabel is doing research here on behalf of a bird conservation organization. The biologist is examining the flora and fauna for foreign influences. 
On the island, we find invasive plants. One of them is the edible ice plant. Here we are trying to control them. It's covered with an anti-weed cover for about three months in the hot months. This is to dry it out and make it die. The midday flower originates from South Africa and was introduced into Portugal and other European countries a few years ago. It spreads and forms dense carpets. In this way, it hinders the growth of plants that occur naturally on the island. Isabel is supported by a team, Lise Cousio and Tania Nascimento, a French woman and a Portuguese woman who record the type and number of invasive animals on Deserta to collect statistics. The worst thing on the islands in general are animals like cats and mice, as well as invasive plants, and of course the presence of human beings. Jesus Martinez and Zara Nunez follow the tracks of introduced cats. And go all the way here, okay? That's a big animal that went there. From there to there? Yes, you can see the size here. That must be the animal that always hangs around the restaurant. The same from our other observatory? Yes, the adult female. The one from the restaurant is a female? This modern restaurant is the only one on Deserta. It is licensed and runs ecologically. Cats also arrive on the island as clandestine travelers with the delivered goods, just like house mice. I'm particularly interested here in how we can mitigate the human impact on the island. In this case, it's about an invasive species of mice that has been introduced by humans, for example on boats. It can have a devastating impact on the ecosystem. The project spans across all the Lagoon Islands. We started on Deserta Island. Last month we caught some mice. I don't think many live here. It probably also depends on the season and on what food they find. We're observing. Our study has only existed for just under a year, so we don't have any valid results yet. The mice threaten the ecosystem as they eat the seabirds' eggs, like that of the coral gull, which nests and breeds in the nature park only on the deserta. The large island population of little terns is also endangered. Behind the beach, plants fortify the dunes. Woody species such as thyme, juniper, broom, and other spiny dune grasses. The midday flower is on Isabel's mind. It is proliferating and thus threatening natural nesting sites. But the greatest danger comes from tourism, which brings in 60% of the Algarve's revenue. Well, the island's nature has been disturbed by holiday makers for many years. Our task is to restore the original state of the island piece by piece. To do this, we want to conduct a major awareness campaign.
Officially, only 400 tourists are allowed to visit Deserta every day. In the summer season, there are probably far more. For monitoring purposes, some conservationists spend the night on the island, in huts with Manuel Alves, the only inhabitant of the island. Today was a long day. If you don't mind, I'm going to rest in the hammock for a bit. Make yourself comfortable. It was really sunny today. A day of struggle. Exactly. Make sure you don't fall asleep. <laughs> a fighter needs to rest. <laughs> it's contagious. The fisherman has lived here since 1984. That is, even before the Ria became a state nature park. Manuel was allowed to stay to look after researchers and advise them. I accept people as they are. I help them, by all means. There is knowledge about the island, the birds and much more. I share my knowledge about the mice and everything that lives here. I have supported the universities of France, Faro and Coimbra. All those who are doing research on the Ria here. I have always collaborated and will do so for the rest of my life. In September, the season for ornithologists begins in the lagoon. Well into October, it's usually still summer temperatures during the day. Until the spring months, Fernando Grassa works on his boat. In 2014, he started looking for a new job in the coastal region, where infrastructure is generally poor. Once a driving instructor, he became a lagoon guide. His new field of expertise, ornithology. More than 30,000 birds are attracted to the wetlands east of Faro. They breed and spend the winter here, or take a short break on their way south, in the dunes, salt pans and mudflats of the protected Ria. The list of species in the nature park is long. Herons, avocets, snipes and swallows. Spoonbills, coral and white-headed gulls, curlews, red shanks, oyster catchers and red-crested ducks, they're all around. Wading birds and waterfowl come to this area birds that visit wetlands. The Ria is internationally recognized as a wetland. We can observe more than 200 species of birds a year, spread over the whole year, but especially in winter. The Ria Formosa is located on the East Atlantic Flyway. This stretches from the European North Sea across Great Britain to the African continent. Little terns, sandwich terns, great crested grebes, white-tailed eagles and cormorants.
Ten years ago, the Portuguese elected the Ria Formosa as one of the seven natural wonders of their country. There is one species that everyone knows here, although you hardly ever see it, the shy Galinha Sultana. It is the defining species, the symbol of the park. In 1987, the purple partridge lived only here with us, when the nature park was founded. Twice a day, when the fish flood into the lagoon at high tide, it's hunting time for the birds of prey. Behind the Ria lies the open Atlantic. Marine biologists Pedro Carvalho and Alfredo Rodriguez are experts on the large mammals that swim off the islands. The birds all fly east. Do you see that? Yep, there you go. Where birds fly, fish are often nearby, meaning also large marine mammals. Yeah. Bubbles there, yeah. just maybe like 15 meters away from the boat. Just below the surface, a whale family. There, he's coming up. We have to go. The fine is really big. I can't afford it. After sunset, it is forbidden to pursue marine mammals off the lagoon. Well, I feel very lucky now, yeah. We were expecting to find bottlenose dolphins. It was our first pet for the day. But Minky well, totally accepted. maybe like 15 meters away from the boat. Last chance. I don't whoa. This time, a say whale. It was a nice way to say goodbye to us. <laughs> I mean, I'm happy already. And I never saw them at sunset. So this is a first. And well, this close to the boat. <laughs> Say whales are one of the most agile whale species with speeds of up to 45 kilometers per hour. The two marine biologists hadn't seen them for months. The Ria Formosa, the undiscovered south coast of Portugal and a nature park that is full of surprises.